Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Web of Light. You are joining Angie D'Anjou and myself, Dr. Kevin, as we are helping you weave a web of light in your life. One of the things is if you're just joining us for the first time, uh, you know, we are broadcast from Maine to California through the public access system. You may have joined us and we don't always get notified. So if you have discovered, our, discovered us recently, if we've popped up on your public access channel recently, please uh, send an email to either Angie at weboflight.com or to Dr. Kevin, D-R-K-E-V-I-N, uh, at weboflight.com. And let us know you've joined our family so we can welcome you. We like to make sure that people know, we like to know who our tribe is. Mm -hmm. So how are you doing these days? Doing all right, how about yourself? Good. Had, uh, had a good weekend, went out and played glow bowling. Glow bowling, oh. Did the glow bowl. Yeah, balls. the glow bowl. Yeah, <laughs> my legs are still sore. I haven't been bowling, well, I I've, hadn't been candle pin bowling since I was a teenager. Yeah. And I had switched to big balls, but I was never a regular bowler, <laughs> and even that was like three years ago, I think. So we did four... Uh, Jeff and his dad and I, and we did four rolls and yeah. of uh, candle oh, pin, and then. the next day I'm like, oh, yeah, no, I'm not used to using those muscles. Oh, yeah. Ooh. So, yeah, so we went glow bowling, and, you know, it was a Saturday afternoon, and, um, you know, about a third, not even a third, actually, maybe a quarter of the alleys were, were, were there, but there was a couple of parent-child bowling. Yeah. That made me feel good. I'm like, you know, there are things you can go still out do and it. do. Yeah. And People still do that, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, have some bonding time. And then there were some groups of teenagers, and they were, you know, uh, and they were, like, respectful. They weren't, like, crazy or anything. It's one thing Dan misses, because they don't have the this, this small, oh, no. where he's at. And Dan doesn't know how to do the big balls? Well, he does, but he enjoyed the... Well, when he comes home and visits, he can go out bowling with us. Yes. You know? Well, the week before that, we went and played mini golf. Oh, well, that's always fun. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so it's, you know, and again, there was a lot of families there, and there were some, you know, I'm not, I don't mean, I'm not trying to be judgmental or critical here, but, you know, there were some groups of young kids playing while well, their parents were off doing something completely different. And not that any of them caused problems or anything. Mm -hmm. So I'm not complaining about their behavior. But, I mean, that's an opportunity to, you know, build some memories with your yep. parents and do some stuff and things. I mean, mm -hmm. the, 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 the mini golf and the bowling shouldn't really be your babysitter. That's no better than the iPad or the TV set. And mini golf is pretty, I mean, I still mini golf. Well, maybe you'll go with us next That's time. fun. You want to go play mini golf? Yeah, as long as you want to chase the ball when it goes over the fence. <laughs> well, no, don't send it over the fence. I'll chase it if it bounces off the, the little thing. But I'm not climbing fences for you, honey. I love you, but I have my limitations. <laughs> Climb the fence. Do I look like climb the fence material? Actually, I've climbed a few fences, but we won't say where I can yeah, get arrested. I uh, know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think next week we're going to plan on going play pool. Pool? Yeah. Go shoot some pool. It, it's very interesting. I have to admit that I spent so many years, and this is, a, this is, a, this is one of those secret confessions, <laughs> I spent so many years so tied up in my mission and my spiritual business and running around and teaching classes and working with clients and doing all of this stuff and whoever I was involved with was always doing what I was doing with me and, you know, and, and uh, there was this driving passion, that's what I had to do, that I stopped having all of the other funds that I like to have. Mm -hmm. And in my current relationship, um, you know, we like having, you know, we it, like having... It's nice these... to see you take weekends off and enjoy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I, still have, I still have friends that are still amazed. They're waiting mm -hmm. for me to just suddenly go back to being a seven-day-a-week workaholic. Yeah, no. It ain't going to happen. No, you've got to change that. Nope. I know this weekend we, we took a trip up to the Wanabasaki area. That's what we did. Good. 
I hung out there and watched the boats go by. And oh, we even we have a picture of uh, I don't try to think what they're called. The remember I don't know if you remember, but seagulls. No. <laughs> <laughs> Way back in like probably the sixties. I wanna go back like sixties maybe, seventies, yeah. but they uh amphicars. Amphicars are the cars that they made that actually drove on land and then they went into the water. Oh, they're called amphibians. Amphibian cars. Yeah, well they had their <laughs> these this man had his out there on the lake. It was still in pretty good shape. <laughs> Have you ever done any of the duck tours? No, yeah, but that's similar to it, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's what, but, yeah. But this is like your your car. Yeah. It was so cute to watch him. He's out on the water with his big clunky car, and, and then he drove it right out. <laughs> I love the duck tours. <laughs> I think they're so much fun um, to go and do the duck tours. So, news. We have finalized our honeymoon location. All right. Yep. Jeff Which one did you pick? Jeff and I are going to go to a place called the DV Resort in St. Croix. Oh, nice. So we're going to go That's there. Nice area. I've convinced Jeff that he doesn't need to have a whole day off on each side of traveling. So we're going to fly out on a Friday and we're going to come back the following Saturday. So we're actually going to have, uh, I think it's going to be like eight nights and nine days mm -hmm. or whatever. All inclusive resort. Nice. So, yeah, you know, and. Uh, and things like kayaking are included yeah. and snorkeling are included and horseback riding is included, except Jeff has said he will not get on a horse. <laughs> They're big and scary. I'm like, oh, I love horseback riding, but that's okay. I, I may leave him reading a book. Maybe and... you should bring him over to some corral and let him be with the horse. He might get a different idea before. Hey, that's a good idea. Maybe I'll see if I can do that. Because horses are very gentle and oh, they're beautiful souls. Oh, so you know somebody with the horse corral? I'll think about it. I think I do. Yeah, well, up in the Concord area. Okay. Well, let me know. You can adopt a horse up there. I'd like to go ride a horse. <laughs> or what was the old song? Um, well, save a horse, ride a cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I think you'd be a little bit. Because uh, I'm, I'm assuming that you've gone to horseback riding spaces that they kind of like let you take the horse out and you go for like the half hour or hour and then you come back. Well, um, a uh, an ex of mine uh, that I was with for seven years had a grandmother that lived in Montana that we would go visit that had horses, oh, so we could go oh, okay. ride horses. Good. We could go ride horses. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> if you ever go to one of these places that now you know, offer like the riding, you know, riding space that you can rent the horse. It's not like it used to be. It, oh. Because yeah. they have to ride it. They, they like have a guy go out with you and has to trot. And, you know, like that, let them loose and let them fly, you know, that feeling. You don't get to experience that because you've got to stay in the little pattern in most of these places. <laughs> The so last thing I want to do. Just be prepared for that because that was no. I didn't do it. I did it once and I said, no, I can't. I can't. <laughs> I, I feel bad. I feel bad for the horses Horse. yep. that the, the, the highlight of their day is being stuck in a line where either another horse has their nose up your butt or you have your nose <laughs> up to the horse's butt in front of you. And you can't be a horse. That's right. Oh, no, that's horrible. I need to find somebody who has horses that would like somebody to occasionally go riding with riding them. Riding them, yeah. And, and that I could do. Yes. So, speaking about riding horses, I'm going to introduce today's guest. <laughs> I'm going to let you figure out what the... What the, what the okay. <laughs> Coalition of... <laughs> yeah, yeah. There'll be the quiz at the end to see if you can see where that, was, where the, where that connection was. Uh, we are welcoming back to Web of Light, um, Marion Killenbeck, who is an NMD and an RN. Uh, she was with us before, and she's also one of our instructors at the Web of Light Healing Center. Marion is a holistic practitioner trained as an RN as well as a naturopathic doctor. She is a lifetime student. She has also received training in oracolotherapy, oracolotherapy, Bowen which is basically bowing with an N, 
Um, face and tongue diagnosis, lymphatic drainage may occur, microcurrents, and received in-depth training on various herbs, supplements, and other natural products. Mm -hmm. There's a key, because horses are very natural. Electrodermal screening, EDS, become, uh, became one of the primary tools in creating and keeping a strong and successful natural practic, pra, na, na, naturopathic practice for a decade. Her goal is to bring her clients into maximum health with minimal invasive and drug-dependent solutions. We are going to be having Marion um, for the next uh, few months, beyond once a month, uh, to be chatting a little bit in what we're calling a Journey to Health series. Uh, about different things. So, Marianne, welcome back. Thank you, Dr. Kevin. Thank you, Angie. Nice to be out here. So, you know, we're, we, I know that up today we were going to talk about some better nutrition, nu better nutrition leads to health, if mm -hmm. I'm correct. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Before we do that, because there's some things on that list I know nothing yeah. about. And if I know nothing about it, I will guarantee you that there is a large part of the audience that's watching this that are going, Huh? What? What? <laughs> what is that? Yeah, my first question is the first one in line there. So how, first That's of all, a mouthful. <laughs> how do you pronounce it? That would be auricular therapy. Auric so think okay. of the ear. Okay. So back to French, primarily French and German work with any of the meridians or any of the energy like acupuncture. You have what appears to be, a, how do I want to say that? The symbolism of a baby within the ear. So if you think of the earlobe as the head of the baby and come around to the spine and the feet and all curled up. So if you see that, that's how auricular therapy works and you're able to sensitize or desensitize different areas of the body and actually change how they're functioning. There are ways of doing that through putting seeds on that. I used primarily microcurrent, which is something like a TENS unit. A lot of people will be familiar with a TENS unit, but this is at milliamps. So it's actually at the very same amperage that your body functions. So you can stimulate or destimulate those points. And then you have the various emotions that fall right in front of the ear. So when there's an emotional component to something going on, say with a spine, you'd hit the spinal process, wherever that may be, whatever's happening, and then the emotional point as well, typically. So, oh. so you know, at some point, we're going to have you on the show and see which of these you could actually come and have people watch you demonstrate on Angie or I. Okay. Um, because... We, we had a show earlier this month where um, we had somebody doing, um, uh, playing, it looked like a xylophone to me, but it was like, you know, toning through all of the different chakras and stuff like that. And our audience loves to watch us be guinea pigs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, auricular therapy. Mm-hmm. Auricular therapy. And so now could you take a little, now microcurrent, so basically... It's, it, it's a petite version of electroshock therapy because you're putting in a little current mm -hmm. to, to do something. So could you go and turn off wherever my aging button is so I stop <laughs> aging? You know, interestingly enough, with a microcurrent machine, you could actually do anti-aging facials. Um, several times as I was learning and teaching folks that were around me, there was a group of us, and we would, of course, only do half of the face until the next week. And it's a dramatic difference to do the microcurrent because, again, it's putting in healing frequencies to the face or wherever you might be using it. But we typically did the face because it was so dramatic. See, now you would never know that she's 130, would you? <laughs> are, are you saying the face or wherever the face is on that ear. Well, you do the auricular therapy for something specific. Say you have a um, person come in with migraines. You'd work with certain places on the earlobes and then work with the emotions on that. Now, for the anti-aging, as Dr. Kevin had mentioned, you literally do cycles on the face. So you're literally using that microcurrent 
in different areas of the face and essentially doing a non-surgical facelift is what we call it. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to volunteer. <laughs> yeah. You can do that. You can do that for me on air. Show people what it is. There's a there's a place in the mall that will go that you go and they'll do with cream that will actually you know like temporarily it's yeah, just temporary, temporary thing. Right. Do stuff, but they'll do half your face and then they'll see the difference. And um, I went by them once and they they talked me into doing half the face. And I said, okay. And they tried to sell me the cream and it was some outrageous price. And I was like, no. And I said, but now you can do the other half. And I'm like, no, if you're not going to buy the cream, you're not going to do the other half. <laughs> and I pitched a fit. I really did. I was like, no, no, no. That's bait and switch. Right. You offered to give me, to show me the difference and to do a facial and you need to, you, you need to finish it up. And we, we got in a little fist cuffs over it. <laughs> not, not literally, but I was just like, mm -hmm. Because no. that's oh. their marketing. So, yeah. Yeah, but you didn't want to walk around the mall after that with half a face. <laughs> what? Look like a stroke victim? <laughs> oh, call me master. <laughs> Everybody be calling me Igor. <laughs> Only on so half of your face. When, you ha when he has you on here and you have to do that for him, you have to do the whole face, not just half. You do no, that? No, no, no. We only do half. No. <laughs> you do half. And then they look at it, and they and the and the audience comments, and I and I thought he was stunningly gorgeous, and now I see you know it's actually even better. And then she does the other half of the face, and people swoon. So yeah, it all works for me. So uh, we just do the other half a month later. That's yeah, no. Um, you, know that, you can do you can do Angie's right half, and you can do my left half, and we'll just have to walk very close together. <laughs> Okay, so talk a little bit about what is Bowen. Now, I know I've heard of that before. When you probably start talking, I'll remember it. Have you heard of Bowen? I know I've heard of it, but I couldn't bring it up. Bowen is a technology that is its actually quite amazing. You're literally moving the tendon. So you, um, a Bowen therapist, we come in and we take the tendon, and you're just moving the tendon ever so gently down Primarily extremities, you can do essentially anywhere in the body where you have tendons, and it loosens the muscle adhesions within that area. It makes a huge difference for folks with primarily pain or stiffness. Okay. Um, it appears to be some kind of a lymphatic, shall we say, not quite drainage, but a loosening of the lymphatic system at that same time. So mm -hmm. it's really moving a lot of fluid at the same time. Age old That's technique. That's pretty interesting. So, because I know they have the massage for the lymphatics, like when people have their legs. Right. Does the bone work on that too? It does, but it's not nearly as effective as the lymphatic okay. massage because lymphatic massage typically should only be the weight, the pressure that you put on the body should only be the weight of a nickel. With a lymphatic massage, oh, whether so it this be is around the more, breast or so this right, is with much a more. bowen, you're actually getting in there and you're moving the tendon. Okay. Now that makes me think a little bit of um, now. I'm, I'm going to completely. I always uh, I always talk about it. I had a whole treatment series of it that uh, m will take the myofascia tissue. Rolfing. Rolfing. Yes. Thank you, Ida Rolf. Um, I don't know why I was driving away, but but it makes me think a little bit of what they're doing, what, like, like it has a... Nowhere near what Rolfing is. Rolfing gets in there, and Rolfing can be really, really, really painful, but very amazingly effective for structure. I love Rolfing. I had a whole Rolfing it, What is that? It's a very deep Work massage, on. very specific Ida Rolf created or discovered, I don't know the whole history. I know very little about rolfing other than having had it done and it makes a huge difference. It, you it's know, a firm massage. Well, it, it, it Very deep tissue, yeah. very structural. It's a, a rolfer does a treatment series on you where they will, they go in and they actually, our myofascia tissue is like putty that mm -hmm. holds our bones in place. And if we have had something that got in an accident or bad posture, whatever reason, got put out of place, um, and it's out of place long enough, the myofascial tissue will support it to be in the wrong place. And I've always said that one of the reasons why people have to go to chiropractor over and over and over again to put the same thing back in place is because they're putting it in place, 
but the holder, the myofascia, is set up to mm -hmm. push it right back to where, where it is. That's where it was. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they literally pull back the myofascia and reshape it into what it's supposed to be. Um, I know some people, I, I know like you said, very, very painful. I mean, I definitely had some pain moments, but overall, um, I think I grew like three quarters of an inch. Sure. And I, I got rid of stuff that I'd had problems with for years when I went through my first rolfing series. A number of emotional releases will occur with rolfing. Like you talk about the, the fascia and various things. It's not just whether there was an accident, but it can also be emotional stuff that gets yep. trapped in there. Yep. You know, you get some of the old DOs that go in and do what's almost like rolfing within the jaw. Yep. And they'll release amazing amounts of emotional storage. Yep. I mm -hmm. definitely got, I definitely had some of the emotional stuff associated with the abuse in my childhood that came up when I did rolfing mm -hmm. and kind of, in, and I was smart enough and far long enough in my pra practice, in my own, it's not practice, my own journey that I warned the rolfer, which he was very grateful for. Mm -hmm. Because he would, he knew, he, you know, and we discussed it. So he was very, you know, he was very professional and very good about the different things. So you do face and tug diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what does my face tell you? Diagnose me, what does my face tell you? <laughs> face or tongue, since we see both at the same time. <laughs> Definitely, um, when you look at the tongue, again, very much like the ear, very much like the hands, very much like the feet, there's a map of the body. And with your tongue, you could definitely see on the on the outsides. There's some kidney challenges. And remember every organ system has an emotional component. So we'll just stay with the organ systems. Also at the very back is the liver, spleen, and there's definitely some challenges there. Wouldn't diagnose it as candida, but I would say take a look at that. Um, from what that says. Okay, and look at your tongue again. <laughs> dehydrated. Go ahead and take a look, Angie, so you can see. Okay. And see an overall white coating, which is gonna tell you that there's candida, um, highly probable parasites is typically what you see with that as well. Angie didn't like that plan. It was a, <laughs> it was a tongue. <laughs> Stick your tongue back out at her, see what um, she sees there. Uh, definitely some inflammation if you see what they call a geographical tongue, which is a lot of multiple challenges within the organ systems. Definitely some dehydration, circulation challenges, cardiovascular challenges. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, you know, again, I mean, our, our, wow. our audience likes, likes to see this. And there's a, an idea. I mean, we just I never had my tongue red. <laughs> yeah, as much well, as you've been reading, so that's a different. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we just did Jeff's birthday weekend. Yeah. And so I don't really drink a whole lot of alcohol anymore, but it was, uh, drank three days in a row. Oh, I had a good Not time, Not that I got yes. drunk, but, yeah. you know, I drank three days in a row. So some of what you said, because I've been so good at hydrating. Mm-hmm. That, you know, and alcohol dehydrates you and stuff like that. And so, I mean, that, all, that makes sense to me. Alcohol, and remember, a lot of carbs will dehydrate yeah. you as well. Most people aren't aware of that. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to understand that if you're taking in a lot of breads and pastas, and you're going to be dehydrated. And birthday cake? Uh, birthday cake does it too, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that sugar. We won't get into that. Oh. <laughs> okay. So, lymphatic drainage. Now, I heard of, of um, massage therapists doing lymphatic draining, but you're not a massage therapist. I know you're, that is correct. you're, you're an NMD and an RN. So what would you be doing for lymphatic draining? I mean, like, what would that look like? I do a combination of things. Um, one is the microcurrent, where you can set it at a certain frequency that will help to drain the lymphatics, and you literally just hold on to the, oh, I don't, I can't think of the name of it, just the little the metal attachments. metal probes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Hold on to those, and it will run through the cycle. When I first started doing that, because it was nothing I was taught, it was something that I intuited, essentially, and 
had a patient in that needed lymphatic drainage, and I said, you know, here's the frequency. Let's just kind of see what happens. And within the 20 minutes that I had her waiting, she had been to the bathroom three times to eliminate because it was draining that much of the lymphatics. So I learned very quickly that that was quite effective. And then with the lymphatic drainage, it's a matter of actually doing the physical work of, like I said, no, no greater than the weight of a nickel, and you're doing circles. So around the collarbone, you do little weight of a nickel circles, and you come down in between and under the breast. You can do the face coming down across, and you come down, because all of these are lymphatic drainage channels. And you always want to make sure that you bring it down through the collarbone, Sorry. and down through the center of the breast. And the same way with the legs, you're going to bring it up towards the heart, and there's a Y of lymphatic channels through the groin area, and you make sure that you bring that into the drainage. Okay. That was one thing that I, my, I've experienced that, and mm -hmm. um, it was really interesting to me that the channels, they actually have to come all the way up and up into this area here. Right, because that's where it drains, is into the peritoneal space, essentially, which is one of the greatest challenges when the lymphatic becomes so sluggish. It's like putting glue and tar into your peritoneal space or the center of where your organs and your intestines are. Real challenge for the body to try to reabsorb and get rid of. Interesting. And that has a lot to do with dehydration, has to do with inactivity, um, and again, toxicity. Going back to what we talked about the last time of the wastebasket, when it becomes so full, those lymphatics become so sluggish, and they're just full of what, what turns out to be grayish goop when it should be flowing, very much like the spinal fluid or your blood. Remember, we have nothing to pump lymphatic fluid. So now I'm going to put you on the spot. OK. <laughs> Because we had a discussion a little bit about this at one point. Because some people's doctors will tell them that if they have the, you know, like all the liquid and what did they? Edema. Edema, mm -hmm. which is why you, a lot of those get drained for that, correct? That's the lymphatic fluid getting That's clean? That's part of it. It part can be it. a number of things with edema. Mm -hmm. But lymphatic is certainly one of them. Absolutely. But it's like, so in this case where you're working with lymphatics, are the doctors all going to agree and say you need more water or less water? Oh, what the doctors are going to say, we can't <laughs> always predict. They're typically going to say less water. But think about it. If you have a stream that is stopped up at some point, do you want to reduce the amount of water to get it through, or do you want to increase the water to get it through, to get it more liquid, mm -hmm. to get it moving better? Remember that a physician is going to say probably less water based on medications. Those people are probably going to be on a diuretic. Oh, They're I see. They're probably going to be on a few other things. So their thought process is, don't put more water in if we're trying to eliminate water, but that's creating mineral imbalances by the pharmaceuticals in, in the first place. So when you do lymphatic drainage then, then you also need water intake. Correct, absolutely. Okay. And it'll drain water. So it's, if you're not accustomed to drinking water and you get lymphatic massage, you're gonna wanna be close to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> because it's an urgency. It's much like if you're on a diuretic. It's like your body says, your bladder's going to yeah. empty now. Yep. So um, now you have something called Meyer Kerr. And that would actually be Cure because it's German. Sure. Okay. So even though it's K U R, and I make sure it's always spelled K U R because a naturopath is not in the United States able to use the word cure for any reason. Unless you're a medical doctor, that word does not ever come out of your mouth, nor is a registered nurse. So this is a old 
well, from way back when, in Germany. They used to call it the chicken dinner detox. They would take in <laughs> their executives for two weeks into a German spa, and they are put through this very specific detox, which is very unusual. When I first read about it, I thought, there's no way. It's a, a dried form of bread. It's quark, which is very much like a cottage cheese, but a little bit healthier, and tea. And I thought, what kind of a nonsense is this? But it works on the small intestine. It's very specific. I was one of the very fortunate few that got to actually go to physician's level on Meyer Cure because I got to know the instructor who was an 80-some-year-old German physician that was quite an interesting gentleman. Um, we did this up in Canada because they weren't able to train even the medical doctors in the United States past level two because it's very, very effective. It's also a series of diagnostics. So when a person is walking, we're taught to look at the gait and see what part of the gut, because according to Germans, every dis-ease stems from the gut. So as a person is walking, either to you or from you, either way, you look at their gait, you're able to measure diagnostics. For example, you can look at the rib cage and where the rib cage sits, what that angle is, tells you a lot about the health of the small intestine. Very, very, very intense and yet very amazing. Okay. So my, you've talked about my, microcurrent a few times. It says microcurrent and um, so microcurrent. Is there anything more you want to say about that? Or have you kind of said it in the other things you've talked about? Um, probably said most of what I'd like to say about microcurrent in that it's just truly an amazing instrument. Um, very underutilized and yet very, very, very effective. I okay. had folks, my little brother is a chiropractor, and I had folks come in to see him that were in immense pain and they were scheduled for surgery. And that's how I started using the microcurrent on a regular basis. I had it and I used it primarily for myself, to be honest. And my brother sent this, this guy over and he said, you know, he's in this incredible pain with, he's scheduled for foot surgery. Can you reduce the pain? Yes, of course, through lymphatic work through putting the proper, it's the proper hertz, so it's the proper electricity back through the body. It's like retraining that part of the body to work most efficiently. And I do that and unfortunately it can take the pain away. And I say unfortunately because if we don't have pain and there's still that displacement, it's real easy to hurt it even worse. So. All I told him is, you know what, Here, we, you're not going to have the pain, but please don't do anything that you wouldn't do otherwise. And he chose to continue with the treatments after that, and we did that rather than having surgery. It's very interesting. Oh, yeah. um, I, don't, uh, I don't teach traditional Reiki anymore because I only teach the Wei Chi, mm -hmm. but I know that when I was teaching Yusui Reiki, I would one of the things that I would teach my students is, of course, um, if you are doing it from a place where you have any uh, intention or motivation, conscious or unconscious, that you want to prove Reiki works or that you want Reiki in of itself, mm -hmm. you decided what you want the Reiki to do, you're interfering mm -hmm. with the natural intelligence of the Reiki to do what is best. And so it's, and one of the examples I would use is if, you know, you go and you do Reiki, you know, you, if you're in a room of people that have, you know, drank the Reiki Kool-Aid, and there is Reiki Kool-Aid, mm -hmm. um, not saying not all Reiki is Kool-Aid, but, you know, that there's the Reiki Kool-Aid, and somebody has a headache, you have, you know, 15 people running towards you going, here, 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 I know Reiki, I know Reiki, I'll get rid of your headache. Well, sometimes if you aren't, if you're not demanding that the Reiki get rid of the headache, the Reiki might make it worse so that you will go and find out that maybe you have a brain tumor or you have mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. really bad that's happening 
and yeah. you need to get it checked out, yeah. and therefore the Reiki is not going to relieve the pain because it's not in your best interest. Right. So that's kind of what came to me when you talked about, yeah, taking away the pain is a double-edged sword sometimes. Right. Because mm -hmm. that pain sometimes needs to stay there until you rectify things. And pain is a, a mechanism of inflammation, and there's not going to be inflammation in a part of the body, whether it be your head or your foot, anywhere without there being a reason for the body to try to protect that space. Yep. It's funny you brought that up because it's true, energy healing of all forms. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, if it needs to be checked further, it is going to make it worse instead of better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's very it's, important that it's, people so your learn body's to mechanisms. ask what, you know, yeah. whether or not it's in their highest good. It's yeah. very important. Yeah, I, I do a whole segment i mean that sometimes would go an hour an hour and a half of actually doing things um on intention and motivation in my reiki one class mm -hmm. to make sure that they really got it and we'd make them practice an exercise and be really clear um because you know people run around and say oh well you can't do harm with reiki oh bull yes, yes you can mm -hmm. and when you have somebody telling you you can't then they don't know what they're doing that's right and so you know that was always one of my one of my points that I really hit home. It's not really harm. <laughs> what? It's not no, really harm. No, but you can do harm with it. If, it's, it has been used in the past for harm, but yeah. as far as like if it makes no. the pain worse, it's actually a benefit yeah, to Yeah, in you. that case, it's, no, but yeah, that's what I'm saying is, yeah. it, not that it makes it worse, if it makes it go away because your, your thing was to try to prove yourself or stuff, whatever, mm -hmm. and then Four days later, they have a stroke or a heart attack that mm -hmm. might have been avoided yeah. because that, that pain, then that's harm. That's the side that's harm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So electrodermal screening, um, that was one of your primary things for a decade. We're not going to have much time to talk about nutrition, but I really realized after the first show that we mentioned all the stuff you did and that the majority of people out there wouldn't even have a clue about it. Right. Um, and I know that you're going to be teaching at the Wolf Center, Better Nutrition, uh, Nutrition for Better Health. Correct. Um, and stuff like that. So we are going to give you a few minutes to talk about that. <laughs> but they can always come to the class if they want. So right. what is electrodermal screening and why did that become a primary tool? That's one of the things that fascinates me with all the stuff you do. that You list that as a primary tool. So explain what it is. Electrodermal sc screening is something that... I was introduced to right after I was diagnosed, actually. Went into a woman who did primarily oriental medicine. Mm -hmm. And she had this instrument of which I had been led to seek out. And I wasn't too certain of it. Walked in and she did this stuff where you're using a probe on the various fingers and toes on the meridian points. Found it very interesting. I knew by the time I left there that I was going to learn that process. There was something very magical to, about it to me. So it was developed in the 1930s, I believe it was, by Dr. Vol, And he started with a very simple instrument that merely tests the resistance. That's all you're looking for is resistance because the meridians are going to show organ or meridian resistance through the system. So you look at the various points, you look at where the organ systems are energetically, and then you go through a series of testing what is called xenobiotics. So that may be bacteria, virus, parasites, um, could be the Lyme's bug, could be metals, could be just anything that interferes with the proper working of the body. That would be within the xenobiotics. And most instruments, you can look at a combination of things. So say, for example, we're working on your liver. We look at, okay, there's a bacteria there. There's some, you know, those chemical things that they, people tend to use in their yards and their houses and various things, the, the pesticides and different chemicals. It'll break that down so that as a naturopath, I can look at that and say, okay, we need to support your liver. We need to create drainage for the liver because that's the one thing that most everyone misses, do not know enough about, or don't utilize. So 
we'd say, okay, the liver has these seven things that are challenging it. So we're going to remove those, perhaps by homeopo homeopathy, excuse me, perhaps by herbs, but we have to support the organ system, the liver, probably the gallbladder with support and probably with just basic drainage because if it was draining well enough, those things would have never stayed there long enough to become a problem in the first place. Okay. So it's a mm. tool of looking at what things are very specific. For example, at one point I had a 14-year-old girl that walked into my office. Her mother was a patient. She came in crying, screaming. She had just been diagnosed with diabetes. And she was told that she would never see again. She would have her legs amputated. She'd never have children, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So got her on the machine right away and looked at what was happening with the pancreas. We saw a number of pesticides. That was the primary challenge of the pancreas specifically. There were other things going on, but for that. And ask her, ask her mom, any idea where you might be getting all these pesticides from. This was many years ago before we saw the dramatic changes that we are well aware of now. No, 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 they couldn't figure it out. So we did appropriate homeopathy, herbs, and drainage. Her insulin levels changed and changed and changed until they were diminished to nothing. But about three days later, a week later, whatever it was, some time later, she called me and she said, oh, I have an absolute answer on that. I, as a child, was raised on my grandfather's farm and they had just switched to pesticides for the first couple years of her life. So that had gotten caught, so to speak, in the pancreas and it just got to a point where it was no longer functioning properly. So she learned that with proper activity and watching a couple things and making sure that the nutrients were given to her on a regular basis, her pancreas was fine. She didn't have a challenge with it. So it's really getting in there and finding out that very specific thing. It's kind of like, you know, we thought that the things in Star Wars and Jetsons were so crazy out there. This, what to me, was in the very beginning, like a machine that I could just go in and go, oh, you have a challenge with this organ system. Well, let's, let's just go ask it. Let's go find out. Well, it's very interesting because, you know, I'm a big Star Trek fan, so all I can think of is the tricorder, <laughs> the medical tricorder. <laughs> well, they're getting um, closer to that now, actually. Um, so this is a machine that does that with the thing. It's a little probe that um, the one I had, there's a number of different kinds that are out there. Some of them are, are more at automated. The one I chose was not automated whatsoever. It was attached to a computer primarily because Dr. Vole never had one that was attached to a computer. He would go through the resistance and tell you all those things. I like the computer because as Americans, we have to see it or we don't believe it. So the computer was necessary for that. But it was also very easy for me to copy out charts or to show a person as we were going through the xenobiotics what was showing up. And we could then look at the level from last visit to this visit. Where are those differences? And wow, I wonder why the pesticides are higher. Oh, you were out playing golf. Oh, okay, well, now we know. Interesting, interesting. So um, sometimes when I, because my medical intuitive shows up in different ways when I work as a medical intuitive, but I have to tell you that there are times in my history as a medical intuitive where what I'm drawn to do is talk to an organ and say, okay, so, so what's going on? Mm -hmm. And one of the funniest things is when the organ rats the person out and starts yelling at them about something that's in their life, and you watch the person go, <laughs> like, oh, my God. And I'm like, hey, look, I'm just telling you what your liver's saying, mm -hmm. right? You know? But this is the fo same form is in a way. Right. You're doing it through, you know, I used to work with something called a bio troop that would do the same, that, that had a, was in the same family probably of, mm -hmm. you know, testing for stuff like this mm -hmm. and things like that mm -hmm. and the whole It's using all about that something as simple as galvanic skin resistance. It's a very, very simple 
procedure and technology and yet it's not been utilized here well at all but in Germany it's very common yeah yeah it's very different in other parts so we have we now have like six or seven minutes left of the show and so <laughs> <laughs> but people have a better idea of what some of this stuff is and mm -hmm. what some of the stuff out there is because a lot of times people don't know what's out there right and they don't know what they can ask um, and things like this how many of those things because you're going to be your you know I know you're in the process of actually relocating to the area full-time and mm -hmm. You're going to be offering these things. How many of these things will you be offering at the Wolf Center? That's actually a very good question at this point. It, because how much technology do I want to have there? And how much do I want to work with a person to actually teach them rather than do it for them? I was, because of working as a registered nurse for so long, there's that element of patient to medical person perspective. Whereas from a naturopathic point of view, I much prefer the client, the, uh, the person who's gonna become very educated and enjoy what they're doing and make it a lifestyle change, not just a, okay, I got rid of that challenge, so now I'll run back to whatever nonsense I was doing before that created it in the first place. The more per person is educated, the less they're going to have a challenge in the future. So I like that idea. So I know that's not a true answer, but I've found that through doing live-in naturopathy and not using a lot of that technology, that I'm able to get just as far with doing blood work and looking at it from a naturopathic point of view rather than a medical point of view. It's different algorithms, it's different levels, I can look at a blood work that a physician has said, oh, everything looks great, you're healthy as a horse, and go, um, yeah, well, let's go get this, this, and this tested because it's a real problem. Um, so have you done anything? Because I'm a big fan of live blood cell analysis. Mm -hmm. So have you worked with the live blood cell analysis? Very little. Okay. Um, I like it. I don't find it to be quite as accurate as some of the other blood work primarily because the live blood is going to show what's happening right now. So that person could have just a, had a wheatgrass shot, and that's going to show up as a different live blood cell analysis than if they just come in after eating a hamburger or a cheeseburger, mm -hmm. especially. But, it's, but won't it still identify certain things in the bloodstream that are precursors? Absolutely. So to me, that was always the strength. And again, we go back to some of what you were saying was the difference between, um, you know, just trying to band-aid the symptoms versus going to the causes. Right. And when you have a tool, and again, you know, I haven't looked at the other blood tools that you use, mm -hmm. um, but there's such power when you can look at something and go, we know when we see this, this is on the horizon and we're headed for it and we know how to interrupt that flow to that horizon. Right. We can shift the horizon with that knowledge. Mm -hmm. Now, the kind of blood, blood work you do, um, does that do that same thing? Does it show the... It does if you look at those numbers properly. But again, it's going through a system no different than you would with a physician. You're going to the lab, having blood, blood drawn, having it analyzed. It's knowing a good lab. It's, um, it's knowing a, a lab lot that will run the so. right test. Right. And I didn't do nearly as much with live blood as I might have because where I was practicing, having any kind of body fluids in the office creates a major challenge with the authorities. You have mm -hmm. to go through a great number of things, especially with blood. So mm -hmm. we had actually done some studying um, with some folks that I was, oh, where were we studying? Down in Ohio. There were a few of us together that were actually doing some work with, instead of live blood under the microscope, using urinalysis and various other things. And we were seeing some correlations, but that only got so far. But see, the big part was how much do you want to have blood 
in the office and create that challenge with having someone come in and check it and all the challenges with the authorities. Now they do different kind of blood testing in Europe than they do here. Mm -hmm. We eliminated a lot of the of the preventative blood testing in the 40s here mm -hmm. um, because it wasn't in the best interest of keeping hospitals full and doctors busy. <laughs> um, or the insurance company's paying for it. Yeah. Um, so uh, you so you can go and f so you have connections with labs that you could get blood work at that would give you more to work with and you would be looking at different things. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, again, I'd love to see, you know, a client be able to utilize their insurance company if they can through that. So quite often with doing the live-in naturopathy, I would send them to the physician and say, these are what I want done. And there's some of the lab tests that I want done on there that most physicians will not do. So yeah. that becomes a challenge as well. You know, there's things, you know, say, for example, a person has cardiovascular challenge. I want to see a serum magnesium, and it's a real challenge to get a physician to write that order. Mm -hmm. When my father was having cardiovascular challenges, I basically had to go write the order myself to get it done on a regular basis because they don't see the need for it. They don't believe in it. However, in Germany, if you were to walk into an emergency room with a impending heart attack or probable signs and symptoms, the very first thing they would do is start a magnesium drip. They understand that that's a challenge. But it, the physicians tend to want to do just a regular magnesium level. And I really don't care about that. I want to know what's circulating within the bloodstream and getting into the cardiovascular system. Because if it's mm -hmm. not being delivered, it's useless. That's exactly right. right. You, it's, just, it's you like can eat pitting. the best foods, and if you're not assimilating it, it mm -hmm. you might as well not be eating. Yeah, the old bedpan bullets. <laughs> <laughs> All of us who have spent some time or another in a nursing home understand that joke. <laughs> yep, that's the sound of their one a day going through. Uh -huh. <laughs> Oh, oh, you mean those one things that, you know, the um, the toilet companies, the outdoor toilet companies actually did some studies and they saw that they were having a great deal of problems with their filtration systems. And what they found in doing those studies was, were that one-a-days, centrums, those of that era especially, many of them, they could still read what they said on them. That's how well they were being assimilated. <laughs> and some people say, oh, but I felt so much better. Well, they had a sugar coating, darling. So yeah. if it dissolved at all, it was typically just that sugar coating. It was very seldom. It was hard as heck to get those things to break down. Yeah. Okay, so we're wrapping up. You get time to give one tip for better nutrition for health. Today the tip will be hydration. Really good water. If you can get a young coconut, have that. Um, really good water will be reverse osmosis water in my opinion. Most of the waters on the market are absolutely useless. One of the best ones I found was at a little grocery store that people used to totally ignore called Aldi's. They do have reverse osmosis in bottles and it is BPA free. So it's one of the least expensive bottled waters you can get and it's one of the best in my opinion. Now it's much better to have your own reverse osmosis unit and use lemon and good Celtic sea salt okay. in that as well. Okay, so there is a nutrition um, tip for you. Um, if you'd like to find out more uh, Marion is doing a uh, teaching a class coming up on the 21st. June 21st. Thank you. Uh, on June 21st, she is going to be teaching a better nutrition, a nutrition for better health class. Uh, and um, at and the, the Wolf journey Healing to Center. your health series. And the journey to your health series. Yep. Uh, and Marion, uh, we'll have you back next month. Yep. And do another mm -hmm. insight to health and journey. Yeah. So your health. 
as we like to say here, so much is controlled in a way by the drug companies who control your MD. What kind of MD do you have? Do you have an MD that thinks they're a minor deity, that tells you what to do, wants you to bow at their altar, and doesn't care about what you want for your health care or who you want to involve? Or do you have a managing director? If you have a managing director, they would work with somebody like a Marion or even myself uh, as a medical intuitive or Angie as a healer uh, to, to create the health that you want, a health program that you want. So if you don't have a managing director and you're stuck with a minor deity, these are the words, you're fired. And go out and find one. Namaste.